or perhaps music with a play. Joanna McGregor went along for the works. Ladies and gentlemen, Sunday night is variety night! Spike Jones was a dance band leader, American, in the 1940s, early 50s, and allegedly he saw Leopold Stokowski conducting a classical recital, and um, Stokowski's shoes were squeaking, and it gave him the idea that it would be good fun to play tricks with very well-known numbers, both classical and popular. And uh, that's what he evolved over a period of years, uh, a very fast-moving and humorous approach to music. So was it your idea to commission a play about Spike Jones? Yes. When I was uh, a child, we had at home uh, a 78 Spike Jones, which I think my brother must have bought, of uh, that old black magic. And uh, I used to play this on our wind-up gramophone and just adored it and thought I was the only person in the world who knew anything about Spike Jones until... Many years later, I worked with Stephen Warbeck, who's the musical director on the show, and discovered that he was a great fan of uh, that kind of music. And I suppose it must be about eight years ago that we planned to do a show somehow incorporating the Spike Jones music. We had always been very clear that it wouldn't be the actual songs that Spike Jones did, because to anybody who knows them, they are pretty well perfect in their own zany way and so all the music is done in his style but none of them are numbers that he actually recorded Well, they're a bit of both. Um, Stephen was responsible for the music, and he obviously wanted to have uh, a core of people who were very good musicians. The Spike Jones music, as with any comedy music, I think, only works if you know that the people can do it properly if they wanted to, and can demonstrate a very high level of musicianship. And then the fun is that they decide to go crazy with it. PBC 200! There he goes, into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scales. Boom. Weight, 239 pounds. Fortune. Danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. He is known for his taste for murder. As a playwright, but I never trust a city sitter. Can you give us a quick, comprehensible resume across of your plan? Well, an English band called Jerry Apollo and the Apollinaires have won a talent contest in Lemster, and the prize was a week's appearance at a New York radio station. They get there, we, we, we find them, when they've arrived at this radio station, which in fact is upstate New York in a little tiny hick town called Pequod Bay, where they're expected to do absolutely every sound effect and every piece of music at the radio station. The radio station is run by two crooks who are extorting money from members of the public by having Esther Ranson-type appeals for the ill and the sick and the dying. And the plot follows the, um, <laughs> the, the breakdown of this radio station into anarchy because, unbeknownst to the people at the radio station, Jerry Apollo isn't Jerry Apollo, but is in fact an English safecracker who is impersonating Jerry Apollo. The whole thing becomes, becomes unbearably complicated so that I couldn't explain what the plot was until, at the end, they all try and escape by doing an equivalent of Orson Welles's War of the Worlds on the radio. We shall try to carry on as normally as possible. 
possible under the circumstances. Stay with us for news of the Russian invasion and coming up soon, the final episode of... The Fat Man. Oh, but, but first, uh, more music. As Pico Bay holds open the airways to welcome Miss Lena Ford. I think it's a peculiarly fast-talking, fast-acting American thing, rather as Bilko and I Love Lucy and Rowan and Martin were very, very, very fast-moving shows. The jokes weren't perhaps very funny, but they came on top of each other, as with the Marx Brothers. I don't find Groucho Marx at all funny. But the fact that he gets through about six jokes a minute is extraordinary in itself. And I think the same applies to some extent to Spike Jones, that you just wait for the next joke or the next funny noise, and it comes straight upon you. And it's, it's almost like being beaten about the head with humour. If they asked me, I could write a book About the way you walk and whisper and move First of all, tell me, how is this very different from any other show you've done music for? Well, it's different from a lot of things in that it's, we're taking the style of somebody who existed, taking the style of a dance band leader of the 40s, well, 30s, 40s and 50s, and um, working from that. We set ourselves the task of not using any of his material, but treating broadly treating standards in the way that we imagine he might have done it. And that's a springboard to treat music as a as comedy and to use music as a thing to bounce off and be funny with. And particularly, what about the classical numbers? You do a version of the Trout and you do something from Madame Butterfly. Yes. Well, he did treat a lot of, in inverted commas, serious music in unserious ways. And what's very... What, why the, those things lend themselves well is that you can take a caricature of... What he did is he put them in long hair wigs, like Professor Longhair's wigs, and um, made them appear terribly po-faced, serious musicians. And then when what they do is extremely unexpected and humorous, that you get a lot of fun out of that. <laughs> of you tap dancing can you tell us a bit about that number in the show well that number appears in the show because um in the show we have to play various guest artists from um american radio and screen and one of the guests who is played is gene kelly so you're actually being gene kelly for real or you're pretending to be here oh just pretending radio. to be gene kelly on the radio itself yeah Uh, how about you all play a great deal of instruments? How many instruments are you actually playing in the show? Oh, I, I haven't thought to count. I'm playing in this particular show. I'm playing the trombone, ukulele, piano, accordion, and the drums. Sometimes at the same time. <laughs> Yes. 
this sort of music theatre, we need some sort of music theatre in this country that isn't just a musical about furry animals where there is no human interest or, or, it's, or it's got a, a hologram of Laurence Olivier where, where we try and get out any human interest at all. Um, we need something that is going to go back to vaudeville, music hall, genuine entertainment, using as many skills as possible. The wonderful thing about this show is that we've got people in it who can A, play instruments, B, tap dance. We've got an impersonator who can do several impressions. We've got a whole variety of, of theatrical talents. And the more of this, the better. <laughs> And I'll never trust the city slicker. And I'll never trust the city slicker will be playing in Bolton, Swindon, Poole, and probably in Lempster.